So welcome everyone. Happy Friday, May 15th. Uh, here we are week nine and uh, busy times. Lots of things happening around the world. And here in the States, we got, you know, nearly 40 million folks unemployed. Uh, we got a lot of issues in terms of putting America back to work. And that's what we're here to discuss today. My name is Alfredo Matthew. I'm the founder of Working World LLC and the Future of Our Work podcast. Uh, I started this community series with Wesley Alexander and Cobiz because we wanted to just create a community forum to discuss ideas, build community, and, and start some dialogue that can move to action. Over the last seven weeks, we've been discussing the digital divide, federal stimulus package, closing the school year strong. Uh, and now we really want to focus on workforce. We have some incredible people here today, and uh, the way we're going to do it is in pairs, talking with folks in pairs, 20-minute um, little segments going in deep, and then we'll end with the lightning round so we can kind of hear from everyone before we close promptly at one o'clock. Uh, we're not going to do intros now. You're going to be introduced when it's your segment, but I'm going to let my, my, my esteemed colleague over here, Wesley Alexander, introduce himself and Cobis. Thank you, Alfredo. Happy Friday to everybody. My name is Wesley Alexander, the CEO of COBIS Richmond. And ultimately, we're trying to facilitate an impactful entrepreneurial hub that's centered around collaboration. As an example, Alfredo and I are convening to discuss things that impact equity, workforce development, education, and entrepreneurship. Um, with this particular conversation, especially as an African-American male, and we're talking about um, getting America back to work, how do we ensure that underserved and low-income communities are a part of that conversation are factored in, considering that prior to COVID-19 and shelter in place, that there already, there already were significant challenges. So I'm very grateful to have the panelists here today and look forward to having a riveting conversation. So thank you guys. And we're gonna kick it off with Omar and Rob uh, talking about the local Bay Area, San Francisco perspective. And we're gonna get started with you, Rob. Uh, can you just share with us what is the focus of your organization and how have you attempted to create access for under-resourced communities to good jobs here in the Bay Area? Yeah, uh, thank you, Alfredo. So, hey, uh, Rob Hope, I work with an initiative that's called Rework the Bay. Uh, it's based at the San Francisco Foundation in the San Francisco Bay Area. And we bring together uh, leaders in economic justice, workforce development, philanthropy, and business to uh, make work more equitable in the Bay Area. Um, and we really, th this work is all about trying to make the Bay Area a place where all people can afford to live and thrive. And, and you know, we're seeing, uh, we're losing the lifeblood of our region, which is our diversity. Um, it drives our economy, it drives our culture. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that work just doesn't pay anymore for a lot of people in the Bay Area. So that's really what we're focused on trying to do. Right, and same thing for you, Omar. You know, who are you here representing, and what is your work trying to address uh, helping under-resourced communities access quality jobs here in the Bay Area? Great. So I'm Omar Butler, CEO of New Door Ventures, um, and New Door was born out of the belief that through job skill building and training, we can positively change the trajectory for young people. Firmly believe that a job can change a life, and I. That's manifested in my life as well. You know, I was, uh, my mother had me when she was 16 year old, 16 years old, dropped out of high school to take care of me. And her goal was for all me to be able to have a life that was better than hers. So she tried her best to expose me to resources and opportunities, and I was able to do that. And so now the trajectory of my life and my family has changed for my ability to be able to work and earn a living. I have four children. Uh, two college graduates, and two who have uh, unlimited opportunities and their ambitions and goals won't be um, stifled by um, just society, if you will. And so Nudor, I think, is exemplifies kind of the idea that you put young people, you put marginalized folks um, and connect them with the resources to tap into their intrinsic motivation, intellectual curiosity, um, and you leverage that and so what we do is we try to connect them with opportunities and connect them with jobs and connect them with allies who believe in them, um, who believe in the idea that seeking um, qualified folks through non-traditional 
um, recruitment channels and recruitment pipelines is key to level in the playing field, if you will. And there are structural and systemic things we have to address, of course, um, but firmly believe that you put a young person um, from Richmond, East Oakland, Bayview, um, in, in the mix, and you give them a fair shot and give them a fair opportunity, and they will undoubtedly um, demonstrate that they're ha they have the capacity to outperform anyone. Cool, so you really have, in New Door Ventures, you all really have a jobs first kind of approach. And, and this is a kind of a shift because most of your career has been a college track. You've been a part of this college for all movement. You've done some tremendous work, Bay Area Regional Director. What made you make this switch from college for all to let's get this jobs first? Absolutely, great question. And so, you know, I think that there is obviously room for both conversations. And when, when we think and dig deep into kind of the statistics, um, young people from uh, communities that we all work in, you put them on a college campus and you are seeing graduation rates at maybe 20% if you're lucky. And so there's tremendous attrition. And so the idea of college fall, I think is not a reality. And so what prompted me to transition was what's happening to that 80% of young people. And so I believe that, um, 80, that, I believe to really address that thing and why I'm at New Doors, because I feel like you put work um, and you put the idea of employment and you connect young people with the kind of means and resources they need immediately, that's why some of them will go towards that route. And I feel like that was what we experienced at organizations that I've worked with in the past, that you place a young person on the college campus, that wasn't really solving their issues and solving their challenges and addressing their immediate needs that they have. And so at New Door, we believe you put a job in front of a young person, you allow him or her to succeed, they may pivot towards post-secondary ed, which we, I have no issue with. But in the reality, we need young people who are skilled up who are ready to um, enter into roles already. I think part of the challenge I experienced at College Track was that we had employee partners who needed workers now. And so to think about four years, five years, and six years down the line was just a challenge for a lot of corporate partners. And so I said, you know what, let me take what I've learned in this space and create those opportunities and create those partnerships with organizations and match them with young people who are ready to work now. And so we have an internship program, a three month internship program that, that includes skill building, that includes skill development, and that matches them with that employment opportunity that gives them that practical experience, which then I think will pivot them to kind of the next journey on their, uh, on, on their kind of roadmap and road to getting you know, an experience in the economic freedom and economic liberation that we all want. You're speaking my love language. I love everything you said really love how your journey has evolved. Uh, Rob, back to you at the SF Foundation, uh, Rework the Bay. This is a really unique collaborative that, that you've been building and I've been watching the stuff that you've been pushing out, the reports and everything else. Why the focus on workers, right? Like you could have done, gone a lot of different ways. A lot of organizations, Bay Area Council, they focus on employers, right? Silicon Valley Leadership Group. SF Foundation has doubled down on workers. Why that choice and what are some of the barriers you're seeing to helping create those quality working jobs? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the way that we see it is, is that one of, the, one of the key reasons why workforce development, development and education and training systems and programs, even the ones that do the best work, um, aren't able to achieve the, the uh, level of impact that they should be able to. It's because the system that they're operating in really has tilted over time to prioritize the needs and interests of uh, employers. Um, and uh, unfortunately, um, especially in the Bay Area, we see that when we talk about employers driving those systems, it's not the mom and pop small businesses that we know tend to be oriented more around community and care more about their workers. It tends to be the larger corporate uh, employers where a lot of the political and economic power is being concentrated in our uh, economy and in our society. And so, you know, we really see um, at, at a minimum, we need to have workers have a greater voice in the conditions at their jobs. Um, but we also need to see programs um, as we're preparing workers for work, um, really listening to what they need in this moment, because uh, the, the uh, career opportunities now look a lot different than they used to. Career pathways aren't as linear as they used to be. We used to be able to sort of put somebody on 
the first rung of the ladder and, uh, and know with a pretty good certainty um, if they were given the right training and skills and, and access along the way that they could reach good quality jobs. And that's just not the case anymore. Um, you know, I, as Omar was talking, I was thinking about a statistic that one in five Californians who are low wage workers have a college degree. Um, and I don't bring that up because I think college degrees aren't important. I think they are critically important. I just bring it up because it points to um, the need to not only increase access and increase people's skills, but we also need to just increase the number of quality jobs that exist in our economy. Four of the five fastest growing jobs before the COVID crisis were low wage jobs. Um, it's a function of our economic uh, policy in this country, and it's sort of on hyperdrive in the Bay Area that we're creating a large number and intentionally creating a large number of high paying jobs. And as we create those high paying jobs, they're um, automatically creating low paid service jobs um, that just don't have a lot of opportunity for growth that aren't family sustaining. Um, and so these are the realities that workers are facing every day and it's not a small minority of workers, it's 40% of workers in the Bay Area. And so it's just, we, we feel like it's, it's time for us to start listening to workers and start prioritizing their needs over profits. Um, and as a collaborative that brings together business with philanthropy, with workforce providers, uh, with worker organizers, we feel like we're, we're positioned to be able to ha take that perspective. We have some of the kind of privilege that comes with being in those, those seats. And so we wanna use that privilege to be able to advance that conversation. Thank you, Rob and Omar. Definitely appreciate the um, opportunity you guys have to be a steward for others that have wellness, especially when it comes to uh, facilitating quality jobs. As we all know, unemployment is almost approaching 40 million. I think this week, another 3 million people filed. Many speculate that that number is under undercounted or underrepresented because people are having issues calling in or receiving a response. Um, we also know that majority of those who are low income, those making less than 40K were the ones tremendously impacted on the shelter in place and COVID-19. Um, prior to COVID-19, when it came to like specialty visas for um, special occupations, even in 20, as an example, 2013, 500, almost 500,000 jobs um, were given for visas for these high paying, great jobs. So in short, or to summarize things, how do we, during these unprecedented, unprecedented times, keep the pressure in regard to creating quality jobs. What does that look like, and what's the call to action in terms of seeing, in terms of making sure that employers are responsive to this to this need? And I'll start with you, Omar. Yeah. So I think a couple of things. I think you know one of the things we've experienced that COVID nineteen has done has really um, amplified the digital divide. Right. That work remote, you know, it's easy for me in, in this privileged space that I sit in to work remote, right? And there are certain jobs that probably we can continue to have the call to action for, you know, large corporations to think about what this new economy will look like. And we, I don't say that, you know, specifically in the context of COVID, but as the landscape continues to change, I think COVID has really um, um, identified even more gaps in the system. And so when we talk about creating jobs that allow for that um, social and economic mobility, you know, I think we need to think about that pipeline and encourage um, companies to discontinue the practice of outsourcing, to really think about how they treat employers and employees, particularly those who are on the front lines and that are typically people of color. And so to really, um, we, we see the celebration of philanthropic celebrations of, you know, well-known, you know, CEOs of companies, you know, but they hide under that to really um, mask how they're treating, you know, those, those, those contracted employees. And so I think the pressure is from a policy standpoint to encourage um, our local elected officials to stop, you know, to, to marry those tax breaks with commitments to marginalized communities. You know, we've seen the growth in San Francisco from all the, you know, tech related companies. And we've seen kind of the, the um, um, publicity that comes with that, you know, and after the cameras leave, you know, you still see communities in suffering, you still see communities challenged. So I would encourage us to continue pushing forward the message that 
there are things that happen after all the cameras leave and we need to continue to focus on, you know, those marginalized populations. I think another thing is we need to look at our education system and know that the education young people are getting um, in East Oakland and, and, and Richmond is not equivalent to Piedmont and Kensington and Berkeley, you know, and so that doesn't mean that, again, every young person needs to go to college, but every young person should have the opportunity to pursue a career in high school that's linked to their passion, their, their, their intellectual curiosity, as I said before. And so I think the call to action is a policy call to action. I think it's a call to action to, to people's moral responsibility around looking at their neighbors and seeing them as the same and seeing them as brothers and sisters. Um, that's what I would say would be the call to action. Awesome. And just to piggyback on that, is there any, um, how do you see the opportunity of entrepreneurship serving as a vehicle to help facilitate the creation of quality jobs? Yeah, I think, you know, your, your co-biz is a, it's a perfect example of that. And how, would he, how do we create those incubators that really encourage what is the existing entrepreneurial mindset? You know, we, we talk about, you know, the young people we see in the streets and kind of their entrepreneurial swagger and the things that they do. Now, how do we flip that to help them see and help them become um, producers and not just consumers of technology? Consumers, not just consumers of, of, of uh, you know, fashion, but producers of fashion. So it's, it's within them. It's just breaking down those silos. We've seen this in the, the delivery of PPP loans that black and brown businesses have suffered tremendously on not having equal access to, to what should be uh, resources for all. And so I think that entrepreneurship has to continue to be motivated. Those are the staples of communities of color, of marginalized communities, where, you know, mom and pop stores, you know, are the pathway to, you know, futures for future generations. So I think continuing to spread the word about entrepreneurship and the value it has in the community. And as a consumers, we have to start to trust those entrepreneurs and, and, and engage them, right? We can't bypass them to go to the big fancy mall in Walnut Creek or, or, or you know, or Lafayette. We need to start to um, practice what we preach as well. Awesome, thank you, Omar, great insights. Rob, from your perspective, really a uh, dynamic organization doing great things. How can we help facilitate or keep the pressure in regard to creating um, quality jobs? Yeah, I mean, I think um, one thing that I, oftentimes happens in recessions is that public spending goes up, whether it's on infrastructure spending or on other sort of ways that the government grows in order to meet the needs of folks when the economy is bad. And so uh, one, one, one thing we can do is put pressure on our elected officials to make sure that that spending requires quality jobs and that the contractors that are getting those jobs, you know, preferably they're people of color led contracting firms, but um, definitely need to hold them accountable to hiring um, folks uh, in providing quality jobs and benefits. Um, a second piece I think is around closing loopholes and these new business models that are popping up, uh, the app-based work um, that you know, provides a, a great convenience for, um, for a lot of folks and also um, is essentially working around a lot of long-standing labor protections that workers have fought far, hard for over time. Um, and you know, AB5 is a policy that passed in California towards the end of the year is, in, is uh, being implemented now and the state just filed a lawsuit against Uber and Lyft um, in uh, finding them in violation of the classification of their uh, workers as employees or as independent contractors rather than employees. That we're gonna see on the ballot this year that those companies are, are each pledging over $30 million um, and there are several others who are as well. Uh, for a ballot initiative to try to um, overturn that bill, basically, um, and to put power back in the hands of corporations to keep creating bad jobs. And so this is a time where we can't, uh, we can't buy into the narrative that they're going to be casting. Um, and we really need to listen to um, listen to those workers. And there's been some important reports published recently that are sharing about those, um, those experiences. And then, you know, one other thing I wanted to mention is, is in something that we're doing at Rework the Bay is um, we're trying to see how we can help uh, foster partnerships between direct service workforce development organizations um, and worker organizing groups. Um, we really see that, you know, work, workforce development organizations can't achieve their ultimate goal if there aren't enough good jobs out there for their folks to get into. Uh, likewise, uh, worker organizing groups um, organizing for good jobs um, isn't going to achieve their goals if there aren't people in community that have the skills to succeed in those jobs. And so 
we, uh, we see a lot of alignment in terms of the goals of these organizations, but not a lot of collaboration. Um, and so we, we do hope that in this recession, we'll see a, a broader coalition organized both on the direct service and the advocacy side, um, forming a stronger coalition to advocate with employers and around policies that ensure quality jobs for all. That's great. Uh, so definitely in this moment when we, we have this conversation about essential workers and all of the caring occupations, there is a moment to really highlight the importance of these workers and to shift the narrative. We're going to shift over now to Joe Harity and Thomas Showalter. Uh, I originally met you, Joe, at the Aspen Institute, uh, one of the Opportunity Youth Forums, and both of you have a specific focus around Opportunity Youth and you have a collective impact approach. Can you kick us off, Joe, talking a little bit about your work with Opportunity Youth and what are the policies you are focusing on to close opportunity gaps? Yeah, um, well, it's really happy to be here and all of the good thoughts I had are already um, spinning by the, the um, good conversation with Rob and, and Omar and I have a little beard envy. Um, so, but uh, I lead a collective impact initiative focused on opportunity youth, 16 to 24 year olds, disconnected or insufficiently connected um, to school and work in Santa Clara County. We're pretty zeroed in on um, career pathways, but thinking about that in a really inclusive sense um, to understand the developmental experiences, the support and stabilization needs um, that complement and wrap around um, the, the work-based learning experiences and the educational um, pathway that young folks need. Um, so yeah, we're a collective impact initiative, about seven years old. Um, and, you know, it, it, your question is interesting. You know, what are the policy issues that we're focusing on to close opportunity gaps? And, um, you know, right now, the all, <laughs> everything that we thought was true in February is not true. Well, actually, it's, it is true and expanded um, exponentially since then. Um, so one of the things that we're focused on right now is moving um, existing systems to work more efficiently. And we're thinking about that, we're doing a heavy push in advocacy around our local workforce development board um, in Santa Clara County because you know, I think good people and good intentions, but these are stagnant structures, they are exclusive structures, they're ill-informed structures. Um, and these are the, stu the, the stewards and custodians of critical federal resources that are supposed to be directed to our most marginalized and re least resource young folks. I would just say, and Thomas I'm sure is gonna talk about this because we've kind of glommed on to his great work and the larger body of national work that he's engaged with. We're also simultaneously advocating to pump a ungodly amount of money through those same dysfunctional channels because that's the way federal stimulus can move through um, uh, through those existing structures. That's how it can be pushed out quickly. So both locally in Santa Clara County, but then I, I chair the California Opportunity Youth Network, a coalition of sites zeroed in on this space um, and locally and then across uh, that group coin, we put forward a letter to Nancy Pelosi to encourage that. We signed on to work of the Forum for Youth Investment. So our policy priorities are getting more money into that space, but then trying to work with those structures to help them be more effective, more inclusive and representative and uh, better aligned to other public investments. And I'll pause there. All right, so that's some big heavy work, right? Trying to get all these moving pieces together. Santa Clara County, not an easy, easy place to navigate, but a very important county to navigate. Thomas, your focus is really national. Can you talk a little bit about your organization and your policy initiatives? Un unmute, sorry. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so what Joe started to say about February, it's it's like everything we thought was true in February is, is actually truer now. You know, it's it's actually like uh, we're we're seeing more of of all the things that that all of us knew were already here. Um, I think the you know the point that um, uh, both Rob and and Joe were making about 
uh, the way our workforce development system has historically been set up is really an important context for people that it kind of Congress going back to the 1970s just put out this proposition that the way to uh, get people prepared for work and into work was this approach that you know saw um, employers and employees as dual customers but really the um, the way it has worked is is much more employer driven and we've kind of been working on this myth that if you just get people some kind of training, they're going to end up in a, a better job than the one they were in before, or they're going to enter the labor market. And that's never been, you know, uh, even in the best of times, uh, there are just too many systemic inequalities built into our society to keep that from really um, working that way without really strong interventions on the on both the supply and the demand sides of the the labor market so uh, challenging a lot of those I think there are there in DC I'm seeing more challenging of a lot of those core assumptions about kind of how we thought about workforce development than I've seen in the past um, uh, uh, so anyway that's a I mean that's a, a long way to say that you know NYC is a, a membership association of organizations around the country and we really try to build our policy responses based on what we're hearing from our members um, so like right now we're really uh, we we worked with folks like FYI and a bunch of national organizations to come up with these opportunity youth um, uh, policy recommendations that focus on things like you know instead of just scaling up the you know pumping more money through the existing channels let's do a national transitional jobs program you know that could be run by any number of local entities you know uh, uh, models like transitional jobs are, are decades old have shown that they can get people with barriers to employment into work at a low risk to employers that they can change employer attitudes um, uh, you know, let's talk about a national post-secondary bridging effort to attack the educational disruptions that we've been seeing happening. Um, you know, I think now's the time to really talk in, in really big terms about what we actually want to see and really hold our leaders accountable for proposing things that meets the scale of the challenge that we're seeing. You know, it's like 9.2 million young people were working in uh, ser the service sector before the pandemic. Um, uh, a quarter of all, you know, 18 to 24 year olds make up a quarter of all low wage workers in the United States, you know, like this isn't a, the kind of uh, disruption that a few billion dollars in the existing systems is going to fix. We need something, you know, we need, we need something really different if we're going to move the ball. Thank you, Thomas. It's interesting times considering that um, Generation Z um, is the largest generation um, have a burden here in the United States. And we also, at the same, same time, we have a quite a bit of baby boomers um, that are transitioning from their, their perch in terms of being leaders and managers um, in the government or in the private sector. And so that poses very significant challenges in terms of how do we get America back to work? How do we ensure that this young generation has the skill sets that allows them to um, tap into job opportunities um, that aren't dead end jobs? And the reason why I'm bringing that particular is, um, uh, dynamic up is uh, there was a project called the Equal Equality Opportunity Project. It was a study done by Harvard, Stanford, and MIT where they did analysis on 1 million inventors in the United States and they kind of identified that um, females were less likely to um, be inventors, that um, high performing minority or low income students in third grade are also unlikely to be inventors or to file for a patent, and that those that came from um, uh, well-off families were the ones most likely to become inventors and tap into that particular opportunities that lead to economic and um, quality life, better quality life outcomes. So with that said, how do we ensure um, that we're able to put Americans back to work without putting them back into dead-end jobs? Um, yeah. Do you have any insights or thoughts on that? I, that's a big, so this job quality question is a big, um, is a big challenge around the country, especially in California. I was um, at the California Workforce Association conference in, in January. And I remember in the session we did at some point, I did kind of an informal poll of like the folks in the room, like how many of you actually feel good about the, the jobs that you're putting young people into? And almost nobody, you know, raised their hands because that, you know, most of the, the, this whole idea that, you know, middle skill jobs or these jobs that you know require more than high school but less than a four-year degree is the future it's like what we've actually seen is growth in 
high wage, high skill jobs and low wage, low skill jobs, you know, this increasing bifurcation and without some intervention on, you know, raising the floor uh, in terms of what we're willing to accept in terms of workplaces for young people and uh, um, also giving workers more power, you know, we're not going to see that dynamic change much. Um, uh, so, and that, that job quality, you know, we've, we've too long been doing this kind of laissez-faire thing rather than saying you actually have to prioritize uh, young people of color, you have to prioritize young people from the, the most marginalized communities, and you have to have a clear connection to um, uh, where they're going to work, that it's going to be a high quality job, that you have a strong relationship with that employer, because it's like, a, sure, there are a ton of apprenticeships in, the, in Europe, but in, that's because they have a highly integrated you know, the government, they have a national industrial strategy where it's like, these are the sectors that we're really good at and we're gonna support these employers to make sure and make sure their employees are treated really well. And then we know how many uh, workers they're gonna need. And we work with our education system to make sure that they're producing young people with the kinds of experiences that they're going to need to succeed in the work that we know we're going to have. And in this country, that's just all misaligned. At, at best, you're, you know, working with a county economic development agency that's on its game and is being thoughtful or whatever, but that's you know not happening in most of the country. So it's just our fragmented you know uh, you know federalist uh, approach to everything that you know kind of gets in the way of a lot of those job quality kind of conversations. Stan, thank thank you. Do you have any thoughts in regard to how we can change that? Oh, me. I mean, that's a. I mean, so the job quality piece is actually. Um, uh, uh, I wish my colleague Livia Lamb uh, from the Center for American Progress were here. She's she's like the the genius about like really um, progressive uh, job quality provisions. But um, yeah, that's I mean that's an area where we really need to change the incentives for not just our workforce boards but our um, our institutions of higher education. I mean, another thing that came up is like you know and and you all. I mean, entrepreneurship is not something that we train you know, that, that we incentivize our workforce development system to help young people with, even though, of course, we know that, like, young people uh, from marginalized communities are our most inventive young people in this, in this, uh, in this society. You know, the, the mention of sneakers, I, I met uh, James Brown, or James Green, who runs a company called Fix My Kicks uh, in Oakland uh, uh, at the convening we did there last year, you know, um, uh, young people know, you know, I mean, they just have, you know, you know, they, I just meet so many young people with such an intuitive sense of uh, de market demand out there who, if with $200 in seed funding could do incredible things, but that's just not, we don't have systems like that because it's so geared toward larger employers and very traditional ideas about workplaces that weren't, were outdated by the end of the 20th century, let alone now. Thank you, Thomas. I love the direction this conversation is going because it's talking about youth entrepreneurship, right? And how do we develop that entrepreneur, entrepreneurial mindset? And, um, and how do we think about reinventing workforce development? Going over to you, Joe, what are your thoughts in terms of here in Santa Clara County? What are some new things that we can do to you know, get people back into work into good jobs? And if we did have a federal stimulus bill, what would you want to see in it? Mm. Those are great questions. I mean, there's a couple things, maybe I can try and bridge a little bit um, between Wesley's question and that one, um, and thinking about uh, a couple of folks that are gonna be coming up next. Um, um, the work of Juma, the work of Europe. You know, I think a lot about, um, you know, the, the runway to adulthood has changed and the number and type of experiences that um, a young person needs in order to successfully enter the workforce in a way where they're positioned to move into those um, higher quality jobs are, are dramatically different. I mean, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what generation I'm, I think I'm the oldest millennial, um, but you know, and, and I keep in mind the, the world was designed for me. White male, white straight male, two-parent household, middle-class income, um, the, the types of connections, the type of experiences, what my parents were, or I was lucky enough for them to bring to me. There's 
um, a lot of young folks who are not in positions where they can, they have access to those type of resources, both familial and structural. Um, I think about the work, how do we bind together what we need to be thinking about now is we need to destroy any idea of silver bulletism, which is pervasive in the social sector. It is yes and, yes and, yes and, in unique combinations for every young person forever. That's the whole deal. We've got to, you know, um, Adrian's going to talk about Juma in just a moment. That's a great way to help young people enter the workforce in a very supported um, way with a lot of structure and developmental um, components built in that is real work um, in a real environment. Uh, Chris is going to talk about Europe's and grads of life and maybe career labs. Um, that's a, a building block for somebody. That's a way to begin to really cultivate uh, the self-conception and build and shift your, um, a young person's identity so that they can see themselves in those places. But it's those types of things occurring simultaneously or in a sequenced manner, the right type of early work experience and supports, the right type of transformational opportunities to build one's sense of self. Um, and then uh, I think I see Vera Jacobson in the participant list. And so then the work that she's doing to bridge um, or, or had been doing um, to bridge uh, county offices of ed and educational institutions with workforce to make some coherence uh, begin to shape up there. So how are we paving and connecting uh, the developmental runway for young folks so they can assemble the types of experience in a way that is coherent to them, compound over time, um, and then where are we pulling the levers of access in terms of um, uh, job quality and bringing employers to the table and holding them accountable to, to do their part in a way that actually makes sense for them and is a value add for them, not, not pure CSR. I hope that makes sense and gets to the question. It does, but something that Tom has brought up, we, we, we have an opportunity for a federal uh, bill on jobs. And there seems to be some really like low hanging fruit closing the digital divide, supporting, right, COVID-19 health workers, um, you know, the, all the IT infrastructure and funds. The problem with entrepreneurship is if you don't have access to capital, you can have all the business plans and all the training in the world, but you actually can't start businesses. So if we're going to do something around federal jobs and the only folks who have the money to really do this at scale is the federal government. So I hope we can all get behind thinking about a federal response that includes entrepreneurship, information technology, and healthcare, which we already know are the big industries um, that we need. We need to shift to our third group, and you all are gonna come back for that lightning round, um, but can we just get their videos up? Welcome to Krista and Adrian Armstrong. They're closing out our, uh, our relay race over here. And um, these are two wonderful nonprofit organizations doing tremendous work around the country. Each of your organizations has deep experiences preparing opportunity youth for employment. What should we be keeping front of mind as we ask young people to enter the workforce during a recession? And I think if you're here, if we can get started with you, Ms. Adrian. Hi. Thanks so much for having me today. It's, it's really wonderful to um, see some of you who I'm able to see in person uh, normally a few, at least a few times a year. And then a couple of folks that I've been emailing with for years and have actually never met in person. So good to see you all. Um, so thanks so much um, also, Joe, for the great queue up of Juma. I, I love that you uh, described us as a supportive work environment. That's exactly, that's exactly what we're aiming for. So at Juma, we believe in the power of work and the potential of young people. We really anchor on that critical first job um, that young people really need to help them develop the skills. Um, that they'll ultimately carry forward into any job they have and, and ultimately um, rely on for success um, in their career and, and in the workforce. So Juma's model um, is that we employ young people in social enterprises um, at sports and entertainment venues. So as you um, might realize, as I say that, we have literally the worst possible social enterprise uh, to have during a pandemic. I mean, it's really... <laughs> 
<laughs> it's, it could not be uh, more specifically terrible um, for us at this time. I will say though that our young people have shown such resilience. Um, more than a job, they see Juma as their community. So in some of our locations, we've had 100% uh, continued participation um, every week, young people logging on to join our community in professional development workshops and, and online trainings. Um, and so it's been really wonderful to see how the communities come together to support each other and continue their, their learning journey, even without our jobs um, currently available. Um, so Juma is not waiting for the stadium jobs to come back. We want to help young people connect to work as soon as we can. Um, and so what we're looking for as we do that are um, similarly supportive work environments. So again, we just think it's so critical for young people to have that real life experience to practice on the job skills. Um, as we move forward, uh, Juma staff will still be there to, um, to coach our young people, uh, to support them in navigating their new work environments um, and hopefully um, you know before too long we'll, we'll be up and running ourselves um, so again you know I just think that as as the economy starts to um, you know as the the recession evolves um, whether we continue to go even lower or as we start to come back um, we can't forget the importance of that first job um, and and make sure that we don't leave out an entire generation of young people need that critical first job um, in order to really be the workforce that, that we'll all need in the future. And Krista, going to you, you're up, grads of life. We recently connected. I learned about your model, super powerful model. What, you, what have you all learned and what are you working on in terms of helping young people navigate that, that first career? Need your volume. We can't. We can't hear you yet. Hello. Hello. Let's see. Now we can hear you. Okay. Um, I was just saying thank you so much for convening the conversation today. There's been a lot of head nodding on my end, kind of listening to the other panelists so far, and it's just really heartening to be with a community of folks that are thinking about some of these really challenging issues right now. Um, and kind of a quick background on just who Grads of Life is and how we're fitting into this puzzle piece right now is um, we are a national initiative that is focused on catalyzing market demand for opportunity youth and opportunity talent really by transforming how employers perceive um, opportunity talent and how they're and really their practices around hiring. Um, and we do this through consulting and systems change work and working with employers, uh, other community-based organizations and community colleges. Um, and we are indeed housed within our parent organization, Europe, and share that same mission of helping close the opportunity divide for our opportunity youth and opportunity talent more broadly. Um, and I think that economic mobility piece is, is a big part of um, our mission and a really big part of our focus right now um, in this really challenging work environment. Um, and so to your question about, you know, how are we preparing students kind of in the time of recession and thinking about things a little differently? Um, I think I'll just start by saying that we've always really been grounded both at Europe and Grads of Life and taking a demand driven approach when it comes to training young adults. And I think this is becoming increasingly important during a recession. You know, so that's kind of the shift from, I'd say the older model of like the train and pray, let's kind of train in whatever we've got and then pray that the jobs will be there on the other end versus really starting with understanding kind of what are the needs of employers, where are the jobs, and then aligning training opportunities to those. And I think that practice is really remaining one core to our response, and I think arguably is becoming even more important, important writ large as a critical tactic um, for supporting learners um, in these times so that we actually get to that job connection piece. Um, I think too, we're seeing that like demand is shifting rapidly beneath our feet. Um, as a result of COVID-19, you know, jobs that were here two months ago aren't here, but there's also new jobs emerging, like contact tracing roles, which, you know, we just didn't really think about and didn't have at scale um, two months ago. Um, so I think we're staying in really active conversation with our employer partners to understand how their demand is shifting. And that's, you know, that, that, that's always an active conversation, but it's a heightened conversation for us now. Um, 
and we're needing to take a much more nimble approach to realigning our training programs to that new market demand and then realigning also our students kind of that are in each of our training pathways to make sure that we're training quote unquote the right volume of students to meet the right volume of demand so while we might still have need for cybersecurity analysts, it might not be as many, um, and just, just an off-the-cuff example, as it was in a certain market two months ago. So really working with those individual students that are kind of mid-training pathway to say, hey, is there any kind of upskilling or reskilling that's needed to shift you um, kind of in real time to the jobs that will be there? Um, I think a couple of things we're thinking about, um, I think, it, Despite the really troubling, I think, unemployment numbers, there are some bright spots of innovation um, that are kind of giving me some energy. And I think one of those is um, thing that like Accenture has a new platform that's connecting people um, with people that are displaced from jobs in one company with open jobs in another. And they have a platform called People and Work Connect. McKinsey just launched a similar platform called Talent Connect. So I think the more we as training organizations can tap into those tools that are being created in the market and help our young people leverage those tools, um, help them apply, get logged in, um, will really accelerate some of the job placement efforts. And we kind of don't have to do it alone, I think is one of those pieces. We don't have to solve every piece of the puzzle within our own organizations. And then I think the last two pieces are really around um, helping our young people understand their options for continuing to build skills uh, during this recession so that this time becomes productive time um, so that when the economy does turn back on, you know, they'll be ready to kind of jump out of that rocket launcher and catch on to those opportunities as they reemerge. Um, and I think that another critical piece in that is really around virtual coaching and mentoring, I think just goes such a long way. And we've really had to shift our support structure for students, as it sounds like Juma has too, um, to figure out how do we provide that same level of care and support um, uh, during a, a time when we just can't be in person and use some of the old tools that we had. Um, so we've actually just launched a free training module for managers of interns, of, of remote interns to support their skill building in that area. And we're gonna be um, sharing an article pretty soon on kind of best practices for coaching remotely because we've done a pretty rapid learning curve in that and are excited to share some of, I'd say the hard yard learning we've had to do. Thank you, Krista. Just real quick, sometimes um, we use terms that people may not be familiar with, and you uh, mentioned the term opportunity talent, opportunity you. Can you just define what that is so that everyone um, that's maybe new to that understand what, what you're talking about? Yes, absolutely. So opportunity talent is really the umbrella term that we use to talk about individuals that have faced kind of historical barriers to accessing education and work and have been kind of systematic. I can't say this word today, systematically um, disconnected from those on-ramps to work. Um, and Opportunity Youth is a subset of that population, and we define it as the 18 to 24-year-olds that are disconnected from career pathways or higher education. All right, thank you very much. And Adrienne, would you mind sharing with us, what are some of the things that employers and philanthropy should be doing at this time to support the work of your organizations as well as Krista? Sure. So our vision in this work is that all young people have the opportunity to succeed and thrive in a career of their choice competing in a job market that is inclusive, equitable, and diverse. And so for Juma, it is about serving the individual young people. Um, but by employing um, nearly a thousand young people each year, we, we're also able to create a learning lab, if you will, of what it takes to successfully employ, retain, um, and train young people for success in their careers. Um, as we, if you look at this recession as an opportunity, um, you know, businesses are going to be rebuilding, uh, new businesses will be emerging. Um, and we would love to see more employers adopt supportive work environment practices. Um, there's a potential to, to go beyond the thousand young people that Juma serves and, and you know, the, the few hundred thousand that are employed by social enterprises in this country um, to really create a more inclusive, equitable and diverse job market that we all envision and that we all need um, if more employers and more mainstream employers can adopt um, supportive um, work environment practices. And so the, obviously there's a, a specific role um, for, for employers to play, um, but there's also a role for philanthropy 
philanthropy to play um, in, in, in encouraging um, those program models, um, encouraging adoption um, of training and, and modules. I know um, Grads of Life does a lot of work in that space um, as well. Um, and, and ultimately um, to, to, to really um, look at what is the, what is the, the job market, um, what is the workforce um, that will carry us into the future. Just real quick, can you highlight what the responsibility um, young people have to participate and to facilitate their own wellness in regard to quality of jobs and giving feedback to their employers in terms of their practices and things of that nature? Can you share any insights on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I would start by saying that our young people are amazing and our young people have such strengths and such talent and there's a narrative that exists about them that they are less than, that they are disadvantaged, that they don't have skills um, or, or things to offer. And I could not uh, disagree more. And I think the more that our young people can participate in their workplaces, can advocate for themselves, um, and really show and, and start to change the narrative about opportunity youth and the value that they can bring to, to workplaces. Um, I, I love what um, I think it was Rob was saying about connecting direct service organizations and worker advocacy groups. That's something that we've, um, we've been interested in for a while because, you know, Juma can sort of package up our, our supportive work environment best practices and share them with our corporate employers. Um, but it would be so much more um, meaningful and impactful if the young people themselves um, were advising on, as to how their work environments could be supportive. So thank you very much for that response. Um, we're kind of coming up to the close and we just want to make sure that each person gets a chance to share their closing thoughts in regard to how we can address these equity gaps as well as ensure that Americans um, get back to work. So Krista, if you want to mind, we'll start with you to share your closing thoughts. I'm thinking about this um, and um, just actually published a piece on kind of three principles for our employer partners to continue to prioritize and around economic opportunity and mobility. Um, and I think kind of briefly, I'll just summarize those. It's, it's really one, embracing inclusive and flexible management practices. So things like ensuring that employees, all employees are set up for success um, who can work from home and have the appropriate resources. Let's not assume everybody's got a personal laptop they can work from and Wi-Fi that's unlimited to access. So making sure that everybody who can continue to access work um, can. Um, two, kind of innovate to prioritize equity and inclusion as workforce changes. So kind of the big example that pops up for me here is um, adjust but don't cancel your internships and work-based experiences. Um, we're helping a lot of our employers transition to remote internships and seeing some just truly awesome success. Um, and I think in 2008 we really made some mistakes around just canceling internships period during that last recession um, and really kind of paid the price both in terms of the hit on um, equity and inclusion, and then also in terms of um, just equitable access, or excuse me, um, in terms of having the workforce that we then needed kind of as things revved back up. And then the third piece is really around leveraging kind of your unique resources as a company to support economic opportunity and regrowth in your community. Um, and I, the last thing I'll just share um, is this piece around, um, I think there's really an immediate desire to add degree inflation to jobs as we flood the labor market with so much more supply. And I think if anything, just to remind us not to make the same mistakes we made in 2008 um, of seeking kind of the highest pedigree individuals, um, even though they might not be the right fit for the job, because it's actually more costly to do this, it's detrimental for the candidate, the employer, and the non-traditional talent that's involved. So just really trying to raise awareness around um, really maintaining those diverse talent pipelines at this time. Thank you very much, Krista. Omar, I'd like to give you the opportunity to share your closing thoughts. Yeah, thank you. I think, um, you know, this has been a very fruitful and productive conversation. I've learned a tremendous amount. I think my big thing is I think it's really important and imperative that we continue to fight and demand for the needs of our young people and for them to not be an afterthought in a DEI um, experiment or a DEI um, initiative. You know, I think that um, our young people have the talent, have the ability to be successful. And I think we sell them short when we don't um, try to challenge the systems and structures that have created inequality 
in our society. Um, and so as we continue to think about our work, as I continue to think about the work of my organization, it is really important that um, we challenge those things um, and don't just subscribe to this idea that this is an afterthought, or this is, you know, belong to that particular department, that this is an effort to ensure equity um, um, across the board and not just equality, because I think those are two different things. Definitely. Rob, I'd like to give you the opportunity as well to share your closing thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to appreciate uh, Wesley and Alfredo for pulling this group together. It's been a really um, fun and engaging conversation. I've learned a lot. Um, you know, I think I would just say, I think all of us, we need to be ready to push back against narratives that we need to move into this period of austerity. Um, there is lots of wealth and resources, especially in California, but around the country that's been concentrated with few people and organizations, corporations primarily. Um, and that money is still there. And, you know, we, we have a choice to make as a society, whether that money is going to stay um, earning more money for folks, or if it's going to be uh, made available to the rest of the country, the rest of the state, the rest of the region um, to actually fuel inclusive uh, economic growth in this country. And so I, I think we're already starting to see people calling for cuts uh, to public services, uh, cuts to hiring. Uh, we just need to remember that the resources are there. It's just a question of what they're used for. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thomas, could you share your thoughts as well? Yeah, I agree. This is a great, um, it's been a great conversation. Um, uh, before I forget again, my one plug is that you can continue this con conversations like this at NYEC's virtual convening in, in June. Um, uh, I'll put a, a link to that in the chat or something. Um, uh, or go to our website. Uh, yeah, I think the, you know, now is now is definitely the time to double down on on questioning a lot of the systems and structures that have gotten us here, including like the, you know, I there are a lot of things not to like about um, the speakers uh, Heroes Act. I mean, it has almost no money for workforce development, but it does have seventy five billion dollars for testing and contact tracing. And if we can get our state public health agencies to see to put opportunity youth at the front of the line for hiring for those jobs. Um, then that could be a huge opportunity, not just to shake up who's in the driver's seat on a lot of these um, uh, decisions and, and what their mindset is, but also uh, to really do something at a, a bigger scale than a lot of workforce organizations are really thinking about. So that's just something to, you know, for us to think about in terms of uh, opportunities going forward, but look forward to continuing the conversation. Yes, we, we sure do as well. Thank you for your time. Joe, I'd like to give you a chance to share your last thoughts. Oh, you know who are a lot smarter than me in, in hearing all the good um, comments and notes from others. I think, you know, um, it's this work that I'm involved in started uh, in 2013 with 21 communities around the country. The idea was that we had a lot of what we needed to help young folks succeed, um, but we did not have it knit together in a way that was coherent for young people to navigate. So it's a, for me, kind of my takeaway here is New Door, Juma, Career Labs, um, sorry, uh, Europe and Grads of Life doing amazing work. Um, Rework the Bay, San Francisco Foundation doing a lot of good work to, to think about um, worker power, NYEC pushing it at the, the, um, the federal level, all these pieces are there and it's incumbent upon all of us to be much more networked. There have been a lot of disincentives to that for us as individual operators and we need to own that piece. Um, and I think just to, I wanna really wanna touch on um, something Rob mentioned and then get out of the way because there's one minute left. We've gotta lean hard into the workforce system to make sure that workforce boards, key public bodies controlling resource flows are inclusive, reflective of community and have a feedback channel from community um, so they know what is needed, not what they imagine to be needed. Thank you. And Adriana, would like to get your thoughts before we close? Yeah, um, so it's kind of echoing um, the last thought I shared as well as something Krista said, uh, which is our youth are strong, resilient, forceful. We need to shift the narrative to really recognize these strengths and how much more valuable these strengths are to employers than things like pedigree um, or nepotism. This has been phenomenal. Do not think that 
this is a one-time conversation. We are all networked now and all the participants uh, that joined us live today, there's some amazing people. And what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be, we're taking a little hiatus from the community forum series. We're gonna be packaging all of these uh, conversations, pulling out the nuggets, and we're gonna create a landing page and share it all out. And we're gonna start a new series on June 5th. That conversation is gonna be about uh, in, uh, the formerly incarcerated and reentry. And we have Jobs for the Future and some other amazing individuals starting that conversation. But this is something we wanna keep going. We only move forward collectively, right? As Joe said, as a lot of you have said, if we work in silos, we're never gonna have that big collective impact that we know is possible. We appreciate all of your time. I think we kept it within 60 minutes. So you can go on to the rest of your days, enjoy your weekends, but know that the work you're doing is incredibly powerful. We appreciate uh, everything you're doing and let's keep building. All right, so thank you so much. Uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, all. Take care, y'all.